Welcome to NWATC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Christian Ramers, Medical Director for the NWATC Project ECHO, and he can introduce our guest. Great. Thanks a lot, Kent. Uh, it's good to be with everyone today. We're happy to have uh, Dr. Virginia Brody, who is the Chief of Medicine at Harborview Medical Center, and also uh, works in the Madison Clinic, uh, where she helps us with anything to do with oncology, treating a lot of Kaposi sarcoma, foma, anal cancer, you name it, and we're very happy to have her give a brief overview of HIV-associated hematology oncology. So take it away. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm delighted to be here. So the AIDS-defining malignancies, as you all know, are uh, Kaposi sarcoma, uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, primary central nervous system lymphoma, which is a tumor that happens mostly in people with CD4 counts less than 50 and often less than 10, and invasive cervical cancer. But what's been appreciated recently is that non-AIDS defining malignancies are actually of increasing importance as people with HIV are living longer. And you know, the, the, the studies overseas have shown that people on heart live you know, 30 to 35 years after their diagnosis of HIV, so they're living into their 60s, 65, 70. Uh, that as the population ages, these non-AIDS-defining malignancies are becoming increasingly important. And so the ones to be aware of are anal cancer, which is 120-fold more common in people living with HIV, particularly in men who have sex with men. Uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, I think we're going to have a case of that today, which is 20-fold more common than in people without HIV. Hepatocellular carcinoma, particularly important in those who have hepatitis C or hepatitis B. And lung cancer uh, is uh, more common and starts perhaps a decade younger in people living with HIV. Uh, and let me just comment on the lung cancer. This is one of the reasons that it's particularly important to keep working on the smoking issue and to encourage your patients living with HIV to stop smoking. Other common tumors, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, are not more common in people living with HIV. So the point is that in the current era, the non-AIDS-defining cancers are about 60% of all of the cancers occurring in people with HIV. And the corollary is that we should be offering age-appropriate cancer screening um, to our HIV-positive patients. Um, cancer causes more than a quarter of the deaths in people living with HIV today. So this is a very big problem for our patients. I thought I would briefly discuss uh, two very common cancers to alert you to how they present and how we might initially approach them. And the first is Kaposi sarcoma. And so the symptoms people have tend to be cosmetic. Everybody's staring at me on the bus. I'm embarrassed. I don't want to go to work today because people are looking at me. Uh, feet, it hurts when you walk. If you have Kaposi sarcoma on your feet, it's painful. Uh, the symptoms of Kaposi in the lungs are protean. Uh, dyspnea, cough, chest pain, hemoptysis, these are very common symptoms. And then, of course, Kaposi can infect the gastrointestinal tract, weight loss, abdominal pain, or uh, bleeding. So when you examine somebody you think might have Kaposi's, you want to take a careful look at their face because the tip of the nose is a classic place, mm -hmm. behind the ears, in the hairline. So look around their, their ears. Look in their mouth. Look at their hard palate and look at their gums. These are classically involved places. Uh, ask them to take their shoes off and look at the tops and bottoms of their feet and look for woody lymphedema of the legs. This is a hard uh, enlarged leg which is bigger in diameter than the other leg. So let's see some pictures. This is one of my patients, the classic deep purple raised lesions. When you run your finger over these, they are palpable. And this is somebody with capacities involving the gums. So you need to take a careful look at the gums and of course the uh, hard palate as well. So when do we think about treating somebody? Well, if they're embarrassed to go to their job or go out, if they have symptomatic foot involvement, if they have pulmonary involvement, gastrointestinal involvement, or that woody lymphedema uh, of the legs. Those would be indications for therapy. So I have two little purple spots on my skin would not be a reason to have uh, chemotherapy. 
And for treatment, uh, the key, the most important part of treatment is instituting highly active antiretroviral therapy. In most patients, over three to six months, the Kaposi's lesions will get better. A very small number of patients, and it's hard to estimate what percent, will have a flare of Kaposi's a month or so after starting heart, and then it will get better due to immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. The, on the chemotherapy side, we usually treat them with Doxel, which has uh, an excellent response rate. The, uh, the lesions get smaller and flatter, but I always tell patients their skin does not completely go back to normal because you don't want them to be disappointed. Uh, the side effects are minimal. Let's talk briefly about lymphoma. Um, there is a hundredfold increased risk of aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphomas in people living with HIV in comparison to those without HIV. And some increase, as we already talked about, of Hodgkin lymphoma. And the primary central nervous system lymphoma is very rare these days. Most there, We have very few patients these days who are living with CD4 counts uh, that are that low. So it's a disease that is much less frequent these days. So non-Hodgkin lymphoma is a cancer. It's a neoplasm. It starts in a single lymphocyte, usually a B lymphocyte. So these are usually B cell lymphomas. The symptoms that might lead you to think of uh, working up somebody for a lymphoma would be painless adenopathy. So my lymph nodes are large and they're, they're, they're painless. Um, B symptoms, these are fever, Night sweats, these are sweats that drench the sheet. Not I'm a little warmer than my bed partner, but I have to change the pillowcase, I have to change my t-shirt. Uh, and weight loss, 10% of your body weight in six months without trying. On exam, you'll want to look for all, at all the lymph node areas, the cervical, supraclavicular, axillary, inguinal nodes, look at the tonsils, look at the gums, feel for the spleen. You'll want to get a complete blood count and a lactate dehydrogenase, LDH. But the key to making the diagnosis is tissue. And what we really would like is an incisional or excisional biopsy of a node, not a fine needle aspirate. There's a temptation to, to just do an FNA, but that doesn't really give enough tissue. So removing the node is a much better approach. And the reason is that pathology, what, the, what type of lymphoma it is, determines how the patient's going to do and how we're going to treat them. And a key point, of course, is to distinguish non-Hodgkin lymphoma from Hodgkin lymphoma, and for that we need a good piece of tissue. How do people do with non-Hodgkin lymphoma? These days, they do well. And this is one of the early studies of dose-adjusted EPOC chemotherapy, one of our chemotherapy regimens. And uh, you see on the left axis percent survival and on the um, y-axis years on study. Uh, and you can see that for people that have a good CD4 count, they do very, very well. We cure a lot of these patients. Unfortunately, people who have uh, a very low CD4 count do not do as well. So the bottom line is we treat these patients with the goal of cure, and they should be treated up front um, with, a goal, with the goal of cure. And so I, uh, how do we treat them? Um, we treat them with one of these two classic regimens, dose-adjusted rituximab EPOC or rituximab plus CHOP. Um, they should be on concomitant heart, and we, we ask our infectious disease colleagues to avoid zidovudine because it is myelosuppressive and they will get very low blood counts with a combination of chemotherapy and zidovudine. And we almost always use um, uh, growth factors, peg filgrastim or filgrastim, um, to help support their blood counts and they should be on pneumocystis prophylaxis to decrease the risk of infection. But we can get most patients very safely through chemotherapy for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and the goal is cure. And I think I'll stop there, and thank you very much.